let there be light. With those four words, God breathed life into the darkness in the beginning. And it was those four words echoed in the cries of a baby boy on a silent night in Bethlehem that changed the world again. Let there be light. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. The light of men. He came to breathe life into the darkness of our hearts. Let there be light. Before we begin this morning, let me invite you to a very quick celebration. D. Willie, will you stand up just a minute, D. Willie Proctor? D. and Willie are celebrating 57 years of marriage today. <clears throat> Thought I was doing good at 37, then it's just. Well, if you notice, the setup's a little different. This is anticipation of our Christmas concert next weekend. There are four concerts, and so it's a great time to invite uh, your friends. Uh, everybody loves Christmas music, so it's an open uh, time for a good conversation with your friends who don't normally go to church or, uh, or would feel uncomfortable in another setting. Christmas is a great avenue to begin that conversation and, um, and invite them and get them started in asking questions uh, so they can come to know Christ for themselves. So I trust you'll take full advantage of, of the four concerts uh, next week for that. If you talk to um, people who study these things, uh, those moments of great progress in human history, uh, those things that have you know, jumped our culture, uh, you always end up with things like the invention of fire, uh, the invention of the wheel, and the invention of the light bulb. Uh, the light bulb has allowed us to kind of engage nature in a very different way. When it got dark, we used to have to go to bed. Or if it was dark, we couldn't see our way. And now we can stay up all night. Uh, now we have security because we've got lights everywhere to the point now that people are talking about light pollution. Uh, that there's, there's so much light in the world that there's no place you can go to find darkness. Uh, so if you want to see the stars, if you want to do any kind of astronomy, you have to go way out in the middle of the desert now to get away from all of the light. It's messed up our sleep patterns. Uh, one of the things that's happened in modern society is that we are now sleep deprived because we stay up too late at night. It used to, you couldn't do that, you just had to go to bed. We live in a culture that talks about light and darkness a lot. But most of the time we have been talking about darkness, haven't we? Uh, the recent revelations of a slush fund in Congress to pay, the, the, nobody kind of knew about except those who needed it, um, to, to pay for all the sexual harassment claims that have been made against our senators and our members of Congress. And everybody talks about how dark it is, how dark our times are. And, and, and we like to think that this is the darkest time ever. This is the worst time ever. It's not. Uh, we have been dealing with this and these kind of situations before, even as people of faith. And as I remind you often, if it is dark, it is not because the darkness is one, but because the light has failed. Okay, you don't run into a room, flip on the light switch, the light bulb blow out, and you don't say, oh, the darkness killed another one. You don't do that. You go get a light bulb because that light bulb blew out the light failed. 
Do you remember one of your very first science experiments? Do you remember this? You had to make a circuit and you had a couple of wires and a power source and a, a switch and a light bulb or sometimes you had a buzzer or a bell. They quit doing that because the kids would, would do the buzzer and bell all day, you know, drove the teachers crazy. So they stuck with a light bulb. Uh, but if you did that right, when you pushed down that little lever and completed the circuit, the light would come on. Uh, now, the fun thing was to go over to your friends and unscrew his light bulb and put a bad light bulb in there. And so when he would complete the circuit, it wouldn't work. And it would take him days to figure out it was the bad light bulb. Not that I ever did that, but, <laughs> but I saw some kids do it, and it was funny when they did it. So. But if you don't complete that, and there's all kinds of reasons why the circuit won't be completed. Uh, the wires can be loose. Uh, there can be some kind of dirt in between the contacts of the lever, and it won't make a good connection. There are all kinds of reasons why it happens, but the result is always the same. No light. Something's wrong with the circuit. There was something wrong in Israel. When the prophet Isaiah began to preach in the 60th chapter, they knew they didn't have any light. They knew how dark it was, and we'll go into that in a minute. But the good news for him is not that you can get the light, not that you are the light, but the light is coming to you. The same good news that they celebrated is the same good news we celebrate. The light is coming to us. Let's hear what Isaiah says in the 60th chapter of his book. Stand with me in honor of God's Word, Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines over you. For look, darkness covers the earth, and total darkness over the peoples. But the Lord will shine over you, and His glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your radiance. Arise, shine, for your light has come. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. As your people were in darkness so long ago, we too, Lord, find ourselves in much the same place. So now, Lord, come to us even as you came to them. And we pray this in your name. Amen. This was a very dark time in the nation of Israel. It was a time that we call the exile, the Babylonian captivity. Uh, if you read the, the history of Israel, you will see very quickly that the history of Israel is very clearly marked before the exile and after the exile. The exile was such a defining moment that it literally changed everything. Everything before the exile was one way. Everything after the exile was another way. And, and in some ways, Israel never fully recovered from the devastation of the exile. For one thing, they did not think that God would ever allow His holy city, Jerusalem, to be taken by an enemy, much less destroyed. And Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. Now, all the prophets had warned that if you do not change your ways, Israel, if you do not repent, God will allow the foreign king to take Jerusalem. Nobody really believed that. But Nebuchadnezzar tore the city down. Not only did he tear Jerusalem down, he tore every fortified city in Israel up. Not only was there no capital, there were no other places uh, of, of authority. There were no other places of government. Uh, there were no other places where decisions could be made. He totally tore the infrastructure of Israel up. Thousands upon thousands of people died in the battle. The best and the brightest, those who were left, uh, probably ran around 7,000, were sent back to Babylon to be trained as Babylonians. This is where we get the story of Daniel and his friends. Uh, they were taken from Jerusalem. They were sent to Babylon to serve the Babylonian government. Sometimes they were sent back. 
uh, as governors and that kind of thing uh, of the places where they used to live. But most of the time they ended up staying in Babylon, serving the king of Babylon. And they became Babylonian. They were given new names. They were given a new history. They were given a new future. And this is one of the things that Daniel fights against. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the story of Daniel, you'll find there in the Old Testament. And we have the heroic stories of, of, da of Daniel during this time, but we also have the laments. You remember the psalm that says, we hung our harps on the limbs of the willow. How could we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? Up to that place, the theology of Israel was simply put, and I'm being a little simplistic here, just, just to kind of make the point, what was basically temple-based. Uh, that is, God uh, lived in Jerusalem, He lived in the temple, and if you wanted to have an encounter with God, then you went to the temple. Jesus uh, and His parents went to Jerusalem to the temple. Uh, it was a different temple, reconstructed, but it was that same practice. Uh, of going to the temple, going to the place where you would encounter God. Now that was gone. So what was the theology of Israel now that they did not have a city where they could go and worship? They did not have a building where they could go and worship. One of the striking things that the Jewish people rediscovered during the time of the exile is that God is not limited by geography. He's always a God who moves. He's always a God who is coming. He's always a God who is searching. And they found out that you can find God in Babylon just as you can find God in Jerusalem. They begin to restructure their, 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 their practices. Uh, things like the synagogue, uh, the group of people who would get together to read the Scriptures and study the Scripture. That happened in Babylon. They begin to write down their Scriptures in Babylon. Uh, so they would not lose them. Now, you're, you're going, oh, what? The Bible wasn't written down? That's a long time. Yeah. Why did they write it down? Because they memorized it. Now, you're panicking because you're thinking of the game gossip that you played when you were a kid, right? Somebody would tell somebody something, they would tell somebody something, they would tell somebody something. And by the time it got to the last kid, it was nothing like the first kid had said. Right? And you're thinking, wow, if somebody told me the Bible like that, and then I went back, we would not have anything near the Bible by the time it got through my family. It wasn't unusual, even in the Middle Ages, to find a Jewish rabbi who could quote the Old Testament by heart, from memory, verbatim. You see, the memorization, because it's an oral culture, you were given the story. This is the story, and they would tell you. And you would have to repeat it back verbatim. You couldn't change it. You couldn't edit it. You couldn't add an emphasis to it. Nothing. It had to be verbatim. And the word and the stories were passed down from generation to generation verbatim. You can remember a lot more than you think you can. Now, we cheat now because we always carry our smartphones with us, and we can Google something if we can't remember it. Uh, but there was a time when your brain was the only Google that you had. They began to study the text then. And the prophet began to write again, began to preach again about the light that was coming. Now, why was this such good news? Why was this such different news? This was not a light you could earn. It wasn't a matter of, boy, if you do some good things, then you will receive the light, like a trophy at the end of a victory. This was not something that you could go get. This wasn't come to the light. No, other people come to the light. But for Israel, the light is given. It comes to you. I tell you all the time, when people tell me they found Jesus, I tell them, no, you didn't. Jesus found you. Jesus wasn't lost. God wasn't lost. Israel was. So God comes to them to bring the light 
Yes, you have messed up. Yes, you're in trouble. Yes, it is dark where you are, but I am coming and I will bring the light. And when I come and bring the light, you'll be able to see who I am, who you are, and you'll be able to see your way home. Not only that, but you will be able to shine so brightly that you will draw the world to you because they will be fascinated by the light that you have. Have you had one of those moments in your own life, a moment that defines before and after? My life was one way before this, now it is this way. I was a very different person before I lost my job, before uh, the, the house burned down, before my parents divorced or I got divorced. There was something, there is something that kind of marks the before and after in your life. And even right now, you're trying to deal with some of the consequences of that. You're trying to live past. Some of you moved to Nashville thinking that maybe you could move far enough away and nobody would ever bring up what that moment was. Problem is, you can't get away from it. There may have been a moment in your life when there was light, but now there's not. The only thing you know that what you have lost, you cannot find again. And what you have broken, you cannot fix. Have you had one of those moments? That's the moment Israel was in, and God says, I'm bringing the light to you. I'm coming to you. No one understands this more than John, uh, the writer of John's gospel. Uh, in his first chapter, instead of telling us about when Jesus was born as, as a little bitty baby, we didn't have that story, not in John. John begins with this great mound of poetry. This, this one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written by anybody is John chapter 1. And you'll hear verses in there like, the light has come into the world, and the world couldn't overcome it. Light has come into the world, and the world can't overcome it. The world can't put it out. Amen. We beheld his glory. We beheld his light. He dwelled among us. He made his tent among us. And we beheld his glory. John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, this light that comes to you. Now, honestly, there's some good news and bad news about light. Light lets you see where you are. That's great. Bad news, light lets you see where you are. There are some places in your house you don't turn the light on very long, right? Because it's just too dirty. If, if the light's on, you got to clean it up. Light's out, you don't have to worry about it. Light comes, yeah, your light's messed up. But you can't be free till you deal with the truth. That's what the light does. And then the light will take you home. Do you, do you remember... That first picture I showed you, that circuit. I remember I told you the light would come on unless something was wrong with the circuit. That's why we have this moment. That's why Jesus has brought us to the table for you to take the time right here, right now, to check your circuit. If the light's not on, that's because something has broken the circuit. There's a wire loose somewhere. Something has corroded the contacts. And this is the moment where the light will come to you and you can get your circuit fixed. So use these moments as we come to the table. Make sure that the light of the world is shining in you. The deacons will be preparing to serve you as they do then you use these moments to prepare 
for the receiving of the, of, the, of the cup and the bread. Lord Jesus, welcome us now to your table. Deal with us as you must, so that our light will shine. And we pray this in your name. Amen. We do it all the time. We grab a sandwich on the run, on the go. Uh, maybe we run through the, the kitchen on our way out and grab two pieces of bread and slap something in between it and throw the two pieces together and run on because we're busy. We got to go through, pull through a drive through and order a sandwich and hurry up. We've got to go and eat it on our way. Yes, this is a very holy moment. Yes, it is a sacred moment. But the reason he gave us bread is so you would remember in all of those hurried moments, in those moments when you just had time to put a sandwich together and you stuck your hand in the plastic bag of the loaf and you grabbed two pieces and you pulled it out and you smelled it just for that moment and you put it down on the counter, the two pieces, the bread. This isn't the only place he's with you. This isn't the only place where grace happens. That's why he gave us bread, so you would remember in all the other times, the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat all of it. As the bread becomes part of our life, we pray that you, O oh Lord, 
become our life. Your thoughts, our thoughts, your desires, our desires, your strength, our strength. So that what you will becomes what we do becomes who we are. We pray this in your name.